Welcome to Chapter 4. This is a non-medical story that took place in 2010. It is about police hacking of my online digital files. A brief explanation of the significance of the digital files taken by police is included, along with my personal relationship to those files. The police destroyed my evidence. This chapter is around 30 minutes, and will be split into two parts. I practiced plenty of covered taping of my phone conversations in 2010. I used Skype Automatic Recorder, my dictaphone, and rectal.co.uk. I taped my telephone conversations with the police, and with many other people in the year 2010. I wanted to keep a physical record of how people were treating me. The rectal.co.uk recorded calls as MP3 files. I stored my audio tapes, including the MP3 files from rectal.co.uk in my Google Cloud and Hotmail OneDrives. I thought my data would be safe in online storage. I was being very foolish. I did not know that my silly personal activities had political significance. I did not realize that people would be interested in my tapes. Some time after I uploaded my MP3 tapes to online cloud storage, I downloaded some of them. The original files which I had uploaded were still on my computer. When I downloaded these files, they overwrote the original files on my computer. This was a mistake I made. This was exactly the mistake my enemies had hoped I would make. Most of the sound files in my online storage were okay. But a few of them had gone silent. When I downloaded the online files, the silent files had overwritten the healthy originals. Certain evidence was lost through the loss of these files. But certain specific tapes had been targeted in my online storage. If I had not been foolish enough to let my downloaded files overwrite the ones I had on disk, I would still have the evidences. These sound files that had gone silent were the same size as the files they had overwritten. They had nothing on them for me to suspect that something was wrong. People can say an online virus could have damaged those files. I agree. But the damage to those sound files happened a very short time after I uploaded them. Tapes that contained two specific bits of information was sabotaged. A virus does not know how to target specific information. I also had in the online storage many conversations with the police saying I am alive and well. The police behaved badly on some of those tapes during their incessant pursuit of me. None of these tapes were damaged. In the months that followed, the London Met Police wrote me a letter saying that they had hacked my online accounts because they thought there were tapes containing evidence about themselves. The police said in their letter that they had searched through all my files and had not found the evidence they were looking for. This chapter involves unraveling an intrigue. If you fall asleep while this is playing, you just won't understand what happened. I shall now narrate about what I will call the first evidence, and what it would mean to the police if they had killed it off. I am sure it was them. Let us begin. I explained in Chapter 3 that I used rectal while phoning my father. I said on those calls, Bastard stop calling me, and stop calling people about me, or I will kill myself. I explained in Chapter 3 that each time I made a call like that to my father, police would come to out front door very fast, and force me to get into an ambulance. The ambulance would take me to accident and emergency, I would wait there, until I was seen by a doctor. I would be seen last. I would take a night bus home. I switch my narration to the subject of UK politics, which would cause police to want to hurt me. This is relevant to the story. What I am going to say is my own theory. It is based on my experiences. I do not have any humanities qualifications. I apologize if my opinion offends anyone. I am human and could be mistaken. I respect the viewpoints of everybody who disagree with me. Conscience in the UK stones a woman to death, if you know what I mean, when a woman uses the word bastard. It is a lot worse if you say that to your father. In the UK, only males are permitted to have such reactions. In the UK, an adult female responds, 
or is expected to respond to her father slandering her in phone calls to all sorts of offices, with soft whimpering, nurturing and a possible mental breakdown necessitating the use of mental health services. In the UK, some immigrant women who attempted murder of family members got away scot-free, because they were socially backward or obeyed their husbands. On the other hand, women who showed male aggression like I did were blackened in the UK. In one case, I saw that the newspaper had used a Photoshop artist to touch up unpopular girls' faces to resemble gangsters. I don't know the background of these UK girls and why they were hated so much by the entire nation. With so much sex protection for women, a politically unpopular lady who was my acquaintance was victim of revenge porn and UK justice would not punish the culprit. Just because she is politically unpopular, they think she does not have the right to be a woman. While I was given a trumped-up conviction called harassment without violence by my sister Vigil Wortley, in 2013, 8th of July 2013. It was used to attempt my deportation for the public good in October 2013. At the same time, the third and fourth quarter of 2013 saw a spate of murderers who, having finished serving their murder sentences in the UK were granted indefinite leave to remain by the Home Office. I narrate these news items of UK politics because the police arrived and punished me after I called my father names, albeit under extreme provocation. The police desired that I receive psychiatric confinement as a revenge for doing what is not acceptable from a woman racially, eugenically, in the UK. However the hospital did not subject me to psychiatry just because that would have made the police really happy. I have mentioned the phone calls to my father, and stated some facts of news items I know about in the UK. I feel the UK have some discriminatory standards that favor submissive women over other women, failing to note that submissive people can be liars. All this is relevant to the first evidence destroyed by the police. So just read on to find out. Several times in 2010, I used the rectal taping service while phoning my father. Each time, I said, Bastard stop calling me, and stop calling people about me, or I will kill myself. Rectal tapes showed date and time the call was made, with an accuracy of one second. Later, I did a subject access request to the police. I was able to get a record of these police visits to our home. The police reports gave the date and exact time, accurate up to a minute of when the police had arrived on each occasion. That proves the police arriving immediately after I made this type of phone call to my father. We could see what was talked about on those rectal calls. This was the topic of interest for the visiting police officers. In their incident reports the police admitted forcing me to get into an ambulance. I also made a subject access request to the hospital to which the ambulance took me to accident and emergency. Hospital reports also log the hour and minute of all my main events during a hospital visit. This gives us highly detailed proof of the entire day's events. There were a half a dozen of these tapes where I spoke with my parents' father. All of them had become silent. This is the first evidence destroyed by the police. Rectal.co.uk added the telephone number called, and date and time of the call in the name of the MP3 file. If the police were looking through my online folders, it would have been very easy to go through each one and just damage the tapes showing my parents' phone number. I feel the police used sophisticated technology to render silent the tapes they did not want me to have. What would the police gain by destroying the tapes of me and my father? I answer that question here. After the loss of audio taped evidence, I still had the two sets of subject access reports. The one set about the police visits, and the other set about what took place at the hospital I was taken to after each police visit. I had lost the evidence of what incident caused this police encounter and hospital visit on each of those days. Now, I demanded to stop harassing and slandering calls or I would kill myself. There were three parties involved, in this matter. 
The first party was my father, who made those calls to all kinds of people that I was a psychiatric baby. At some point in 2010 or 2011, there had been a visit by my parents to the Pembroke. My parents had allegedly asked Pembroke to give me psychiatric treatment until I became more close to themselves. I think the police were sadistic towards me. I think they felt thrilled with my father's allegation I was born as a psychiatric baby. Mind you I was over 50 years of age. Not a baby. The police is the second party. They were involved in how to handle me when I made those calls. The Pembroke are the third party involved in this matter. Let me clarify. The Pembroke were a mental health centre. Every locality in the UK has a mental health centre. Like every locality in the UK has a garbage collection, public library, and council. They do not have any qualifications. They are on NHS payroll. Mostly their work is to sit in a warm office from 9 to 5 drinking cups of tea and answering the phone. They also provide sandwiches and money to drunks who flatter the women in that office. People released from prison had a relationship with the Pembroke. There were also people on the dole, who got a monthly check without working. This was due to being physically or mentally disabled. Some of those people needed to visit the Pembroke each month to get their social services check released. So their visit was a formality. The staff there had an appearance of illiteracy. To my eyes. Their handwritings were those of an uneducated person. That is just my assessment. However to work for the health service I assume you must have crossed your 18th birthday, and passed your school leaving examination. Perhaps they did some diploma in a subject that requires no brains. I do not feel men who stand outside our front door and start kicking it when I am alone at home would have any qualifications. What have I said about them that makes them a medical center? Nothing. It seems like a welfare house of sorts run by petty officials. But regular psychiatrists visited there from time to time. What I have said so far about Pembroke is true of any mental center in the UK. I did not take treatment from the Pembroke. I would not speak to people like them. They were, I understand keeping some kind of false records like I was getting treatment from them. All three parties knew that I said I will kill myself if these calls saying do not stop. Telling all kinds of offices I am a psychiatric baby. The police rushed me to hospital. But how about stopping those calls? The Pembroke were on everything that happened to me because the police had told them to do whatever they liked. The Pembroke were an abuser against whom called the police would not work. The police or border agency had given Pembroke the power to monitor everything that went on with me, even though I did not speak with Pembroke, and Pembroke did not attend at any of my incidents. The Pembroke were like a remotely located, police-appointed godfather. They were party number three. My question about parties one, two and three is, if someone said they would kill themselves if certain phone calls did not stop, how about stopping those calls? What if I did kill myself? If parties 1, 2 and 3 really believed I was a psychiatric baby, was there not a greater chance I would kill myself? Is this an intention to commit manslaughter? By damaging the rectal tapes of me and my father, the police destroyed the only evidence I needed to justify a case of manslaughter against the police. I don't know if one can bring a case of manslaughter against the police in the UK, but people would understand logic. Some people would agree the police, in my particular case deserved a manslaughter charge, 